We can see in the Old Testament written hundreds of years before the Messiah that he would be crucified. And we can also see in the Old Testament that the Messiah is the Son of God. But does the Old Testament go as far as telling us what the name of the Messiah would be? And does it even tell us some of the positions he will hold along with being the Messiah? Before I get into all that, I want to establish what Jesus' name would be in Hebrew and how we can know for sure what his Hebrew name is. For starters, the New Testament was written in Greek, and in every Greek New Testament manuscript, the Greek name we have for Jesus is Iesus. Now in the 3rd to 2nd century BC, the Old Testament was translated into Greek. That translation is known as the Septuagint. In the Septuagint, the name that they translated from the Hebrew Bible into Iesus was Yehoshua or Yeshua. So simply put, Jesus which is Iesus in Greek would be Yeshua or Yehoshua in Hebrew. In the Old Testament we see that Joshua the son of Jehozadak is called Yehoshua in Hebrew in verses such as Zechariah 6.11, Haggai 1.12 and Haggai 2.2. And then we see the same Joshua son of Jehozadak also being called Yeshua in the original Hebrew or Aramaic in verses such as Ezra 3.8 and Ezra 5.2. So having established that Jesus' name in Hebrew would be Yeshua or Yehoshua, and that we can see that the two names Yeshua and Yehoshua are a variation of the same name, since the two names can and have both been applied to the same person, Joshua the son of Jehozadak. I now want to go into the book of Zechariah where it tells us the name that the Messiah would have. So reading from Zechariah chapter 3 verse 8, we see that Zechariah saw the angel of the Lord speaking to Joshua where he says, Hear, O Joshua, the high priest. You and your companions who sit before you, for they are a wonder a sign. For behold, I am bringing forth my servant, the branch. We see here that Joshua was a wonder a sign. In the Hebrew, we have the word mofet, which can mean omen or a sign of things to come. The NIV translates wonder a sign as symbolic of things to come. But how was Joshua symbolic of things to come? The next line explains it. For behold, I am bringing forth my servant, the branch. Servant can be a title for the Messiah, as we can see in verses such as Isaiah chapter 42 verse 1, chapter 52 verse 13, and chapter 53 verse 11. And branch is even more so a title for the Messiah, as we can see from verses like Zechariah 6.12, Isaiah 4.2, Isaiah 11.1, 1, and Jeremiah 23 verse 5. So does the Old Testament tell us the name of the Messiah? Yes, by Joshua the son of Jehozadak who foreshadowed the coming of the Messiah by sharing the same name. And he also was a picture of the Messiah by being both a king and a priest, something we will look into further when we get to chapter 6. But first I want to continue where we left off in chapter 3 and move on to verse 9 where we see a very interesting passage. For behold the stone that I have laid before Joshua, upon the stone are seven eyes. Behold, I will engrave its inscription, says the Lord of hosts and I will remove the inequity of that land in one day. The stone is the Messiah, as we can see from verses such as Psalm 118.22, Isaiah 8.26, Isaiah 28.16, Acts 4 verse 11, Matthew 21.42, and 1 Peter chapter 2 verses 6-8. And we see that upon the stone are seven eyes, which signify the omniscience and dominion that the stone possesses. We also see that God will engrave its inscription, pointing to the beauty and majesty of Christ, who exceeds the glory of the stones in the temple, which are just a copy and shadow of the heavenly things. Yet Christ has not entered the holy places made with hands, which are copies of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. For as Christ said of his own body, In this place there is one greater than the temple. Jesus is greater than the temple. He is the fulfillment of what the temple stood for, forgiveness of sins and perfect reconciliation to God. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats could take away sins. As they practiced for hundreds of years in the temple until Christ left his throne in heaven and dwelt among us, because he had to be made like his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For as we saw from Hebrews 10 verse 4, the blood of bulls and goats could not remove sin. For just as the temple was a copy and shadow of the things in heaven, so were the blood of bulls and goats a shadow of what was to come, the perfect Lamb of God, Jesus Christ who perfectly cleanses us of all iniquity. Also at the end of Zechariah 3 verse 9, we see that the iniquity of the land will be removed in one day. 
when the stone which is Jesus Christ is revealed. Which is exactly what happened when Jesus, God's servant, the branch, the stone which was rejected, was crucified for the sins of the world. Everlasting atonement came, as the scripture says, in one day. Not that he should offer himself often, as the high priest enters the most holy place every year with blood of another. He then would have had to suffer often since the foundation of the world, but now, once at the end of the ages, he has appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Now I'm going to move on to chapter 6 where we see that it was further prophesied that the Messiah would be both a king and a priest. Joshua the son of Jehozadak, who as we saw in Zechariah 3.8, is symbolic of what was to come. He is a priest, and yet as we see in verse 11 of chapter 6, he is crowned as a king. In this verse, God showed through Joshua that the Messiah, Jesus, would be both a king and a high priest. And with this passage telling us that the Messiah would be a priest, comes the guarantee that the Messiah would in some way bring forgiveness of sins. It's really amazing that God has not only shown us what the name of the Messiah was going to be in the book of Zechariah, which was written over 500 years before Jesus came, but also that He has given us so many prophecies that tell us that the Messiah would die a sin-atoning death. As it says in 1 Corinthians 15, Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that He was buried, and that He rose again the third day according to the scriptures, and that He was seen by Cephas, then by the twelve. After that, He was seen by over 500 brethren at once. So let us put our faith in Christ, for only He is able to protect our souls from the judgment to come. It is He who Moses and the prophets wrote about. If you put your trust in Jesus Christ and in Him alone and believe that He has washed away your every sin that you have ever committed against the Almighty God who gave you life, then God's will will be fulfilled in your life, and His will is to freely give you eternal life. And this is the only way that God's will will be fulfilled in your life if you accept what He did for you on the cross 2,000 years ago. Thank you for watching, take care, and God bless you all.